When we're building a subwoofer enclosure that has a port, there is definitely more than one way to do so. The most common types of subwoofer box ports are circular round pipe style ports and slot ports that are usually square or rectangular in shape. But a slightly more unusual port style that I do see from time to time is the octo port. Now personally, I'm not the biggest fan of this style of port and I'll tell you more why later, but you guys have been asking, how do we make one of these? So I figured, what the heck, let's take a look. First off, why would you want an octo port as your subwoofer box port? Well, an advantage of any time you make something custom is you can make it custom to your exact parameters. Imagine that we want to use a round port for our subwoofer enclosure. Anytime we are picking the size of the port, the port cross-sectional area and its length along with the box's internal air volume define the tuning of the box. The problem is anytime we do this, we would use a piece of off-the-shelf pipe material. This means that we are limited to the sizes that we can choose. And for any of us that have gone through the math of designing a custom subwoofer enclosure, we know that sometimes one pipe size can be far too large, and the next size down can be far too small. It would be much better if we could choose our own cross-sectional area. Now I know we could still make a round port a custom size by doing stack fabrication, where basically we would stack a bunch of wooden rings together. But to cut out a bunch of rings would take quite a bit of time and it does use up quite a bit of materials in comparison to what we can do here. So in cases that you would normally consider a round port but you want to be able to really dial in that cross-sectional area, the octoport might be a good choice. So now we need to get into how do we design and build the Octoport. We're gonna do that, but really quick, I do wanna thank our monthly channel sponsor, Audio Control. When it comes to adding a subwoofer to a vehicle, you definitely wanna check out the LC series of amps from Audio Control, and this one here is the LC-1.1500, 1500 watts RMS at two ohms. But don't get it twisted, my friends, because this is not your standard subwoofer amplifier. This has some additional added special features, one being the AccuBase. Factory car audio systems don't have powerful subwoofers, so what they like to do is while you turn up the volume, they like to roll that bass off in order to protect their cheap and expensive stock speakers. But we are adding a subwoofer and we can handle that bass, so we want to make sure it's there. We can bring it back in with the AccuBase functionality. This amp also has gain setting lights and a bunch of other features. If you guys want to learn more, definitely check out the link down in the video description. So let's get into designing our Octoport. The first thing we need to determine are the dimensions of this. For our math for the subwoofer box port, we would design like normal, but instead of doing area of a circle or area of a rectangle, in this case we're going to do area of an octagon. So I recommend just searching that on Google and it will pop up this formula and we can easily enter a value. Let's say our subwoofer box math has told us that we need a cross-sectional area of around 30 square inches. Now obviously we could solve this equation, we could make big A equal to 30 and then we could solve for little a, but the other option here is we can just start putting in values until we get A equals 30. So in this case, if we do two inches for side little a, that's going to give us a cross-sectional area of 19.31 and remember our target is 30 square inches. So let's try two and a quarter, that gets us closer but not quite there yet. Let's do two and a half. So there we go, if our side is two and a half inches, we're gonna have a cross-sectional area of 30.18 square inches. So what we could do is now when we're doing our subwoofer box math, we could use this as our new area and we're going to use two and a half when we go to build this. Now the first cutting step we need to do here is we're going to take a piece of material and we're going to cut it to the length, the final length that we've calculated for what we need for our port length. So this is completely an example piece here, but I'm going to say that that's 14 and a half. I'm gonna cut that value. So that is the length of our port. So now all of our cuts are going to be made in this direction. So the next thing we need to do is we need to angle our blade. The magic angle value that we need to set our table saw to is 22 and a half degrees. Now we can use the built-in gauge on our table saw, but there is a better way to make sure that we get a more perfect adjustment. I recommend one of these angle cubes. We can put it on our table here here and we can zero it out and then we can attach it to the side of the saw blade there and you can see we're at 22.6 so I do need to adjust this slightly. There we go now we are at a perfect 22 and a half degrees. The first cut I'm going to make is just to get rid of this flat edge. 
So here is our first angled cut, and based on the math we did earlier, we know that we want this inside face of the octoport to be two and a half inches. Now you might think, okay, I'll just adjust my fence so that it is at two and a half inches and I'll make that cut. But the math doesn't work out that way because when we go to run this against the fence, we want the blade to be cutting at this angle here. So in order to do that, the top of this surface is what's going to touch the fence which obviously isn't the same as being down here. You can do the math in order to figure out what you need to set your fence at, but I have an easier way that we're going to do now. The easier way is I'm just going to set my fence a couple of inches larger than what I want my measurement to be. So I'm just going to say five inches. It is important that we pick a value that we know. So I'm gonna lock the fence right here, five inches. Now I'm going to take this board and I'm going to flip it over so there's that angled face there. We're gonna have the top of the angled part touching the fence. That way our blade is cutting this way and I'm going to make a cutting pass. So I've got my piece here and now instead of doing a bunch of trigonometry and figuring out all the angles and the offset and all that, all we need to do is a simple subtraction. What I'll do is I'll measure what this cut ended up being. So if I hold up my ruler here and take a measurement, it's four and 11 sixteenths. So I write that down and I know that I want that cut to actually be two and a half inches. So if I do four and 11 sixteenths minus two and a half, that gives me two and three sixteenths of an inch. So what does that value tell me? That tells me how far I now need to move this. So I'm gonna move two inches, which takes me down to three and I need to move another three sixteenths from there. So one, two, three. I'll lock that into place and now we can make our cut. So now check it out guys with some very simple math. If we do take a measurement here now, the inside of our octoport piece is exactly two and a half inches which is what we wanted. So now life is very easy. We've got our fence set. We don't need to adjust it anymore. We're going to make our seven different cuts. And I just wanna make sure that each time I'm flipping over my board so that this top angle is touching the fence. We have our eight identical pieces cut now, and we do need to obviously glue these together. Now, rather than coming up with some crazy clamp that is gonna hold everything together, I like to just use painter's tape. I've already taped the first two together here, and you can see you just run a strip of the tape along the seam. That way when we add glue in the angled part in between, we can just fold them together and we can let it dry like this, which is going to make everything solid. So I'm gonna get them all flipped over and I'm going to apply that painter's tape on each of the seams. I've got everything taped up here and you will notice that I went with a slightly wider tape and that's because that thinner tape that I was using before when I did a test roll up, it had a tendency to want to easily kind of separate. So I wanna make sure that that definitely doesn't happen during the glue drying process. So I went with this wider tape here. Let's do a test roll up. What's up? Check it out dudes, this is looking pretty sweet. I like it, so now we need to carefully set it back down and obviously add glue to all those seams. Once I've applied all the glue on those inside seams, we don't wanna to forget to have glue on the ends as well. Once all the glue is applied, we can start to roll this up. Now I do wanna make sure that I have a couple of extra pieces of tape on hand, that way I can secure the seam together once everything is rolled together. Now while this is drying, let's talk about how we would actually attach this to the inside of the box. Now earlier when we were talking about cutting the length of the port, I did put a note on screen mentioning that we would also need to account for the outside of our box here and if we were having anything holding the port on the inside. And in this part of the video, I wanna describe what I mean by that. Let's say that this piece here is the outside of our subwoofer box. Obviously it could be much larger or smaller depending on what the final dimensions of our enclosure are. We're just doing a sample piece, so this is the outside of our box. I've put the outside of our box on the the bottom here and I've lined up where I want the port to be mounted. So what I'm gonna do is take a pencil and I'm gonna scribe a line around the inside of the port. So that gives us this cutout that we need to make right here. Now I had to write stop on there of course to give it that authentic stop sign vibe since after all, it is an octagon. Now, if you only have a jigsaw, you could of course drill a hole and carefully cut this out using only the jigsaw, but I wanna get a little bit more of a perfect finish. So I'm gonna be using my routers. 
So on my rough cutting pass here where I am going to use a jigsaw, I'm not going to cut all the way up to the edge. I'm going to save about an eighth of an inch. Now normally I would apply wood glue between these two different pieces and clamp it and allow it to set. But since we are on a time crunch and this is just a practice piece to teach you guys, I'm just going to be using CA glue. So I've given the CA glue a few minutes to dry now. So if we flip this over, we can see our rough cut edge. So now we're gonna take it over to the router and I'm going to use this flush trim bit to make my cut. What's going to happen is these bearings here, those are going to ride against the inside of the port and that cutting flute on the bottom is going to cut my piece of wood here to make it perfectly flush. Now you can see why when we cut the length of our port pieces, we do wanna take into account any additional length that is going to be added by the outside of the box or any inside port finishing that we're going to be doing because it does add length to the port. Now I don't want this hard corner for the air to flow over, so we're going to be using a round over bit to smooth that out. You gotta love that round over bit because look how much nicer this is already looking. We now have a real nice smooth transition for that air coming in and out of the port. What do you think guys? Looks pretty nice. Now a bonus little pro tip for you guys, depending on how you wanna finish this enclosure, something that I like to do is you can take your round over bit and you can actually raise it a little bit more out of the table. And what that will do is you can see there's a 90 degree corner here. If you come out of the table a little bit more, that means our bit is going to be digging into the material a little bit more. And what it will do is it will actually leave a nice hard groove at the edge of this round over. And why that is nice is imagine you were carpeting this, but painting the inside of the port. It would be easy to paint the port first and then you carpet over this and now you have a nice hard transition line that you can run your knife blade in and get a perfect cut around the edge of this port. It's not like you're trying to freehand it and ending up with a wonky looking edge. So that is the outside of our port. Could we be done now? Could we peel the tape off and just let this be the inside of the port? Yes, we could, but there is something extra I like to do and I wanna do a little bit of interior port end finishing with this piece. The steps for making this inside piece were very similar to what I did on the outside of the box. I attached this inner piece of wood using CA glue and then I used a flush trim bit to copy around the outside side of the port this time along with the inside of the port and then again we used a round over bit a little bit smaller this time that way I could round over both the outside and the inside of the port. Now there are a couple of reasons that I really like adding this additional piece. First of all when we made all of the walls of the port obviously they're only attached to each other with that glue seam between them and now when we add this piece and when we add this piece this adds a ton more strength because we now have a common piece attaching everything together. Another reason I like having this is it gives me an area to add more of a round over to the inside of the port. You could do a round over on these pieces here, but you end up with that seam in between. It just doesn't look as good as adding this additional solid piece and then rounding over that on the inside and outside. Now the final reason I like having this interior piece, and this is the biggest reason, and it's something that I see all the time. A lot of times guys will add this big massive port, but there's nothing supporting the other end of it. In some of these really, really high power builds that can actually lead to the port flexing and vibrating, creating unwanted noise. The other thing is imagine all these big heavy pieces of the port sticking out here. And if there's not a support here, this is just basically a big lever arm. And over time, the wood is going to want to separate up here because it's just constantly under stress from the weight of the port. So now this is much more strong. I can put a ton of weight on this. It's not going anywhere. So let's get this painter's tape off and look at the finished port. So check it out guys, here is the finished Octoport with the tape all removed, get that inside support and then the outside of our box, of course, as well. I definitely do like the way that this port looks. It's definitely different looking. I do like that we can control the cross-sectional area, but there are a couple of downsides for this style of port. First of all, if you've ever done the math for designing a subwoofer enclosure, you probably know that the lower you want to tune a box, the longer it makes the port. With a port style like this, this can be a problem. As an example, let's say we're making a box for this 12-inch subwoofer. A pretty common ported air volume for a 12 inch subwoofer is let's say that we're around two cubic feet and that we want a tuning frequency of 32 hertz. I'm just doing this to make a point. And let's say that we're using the typical rule of 
thumb of 16 square inches per cubic foot. So we have 32 square inches of cross-sectional area. And if we do all of this math, we can see that we need a port that is 37 and a quarter inches long. That is a pretty long port. And if you think about it, for a two cubic foot box, odds are you're not even going to have the full length of the box be this long. That's one of the big reasons that I like using the slot ports is because it's easy to just build them into the construction of the enclosure, have them fold on the inside. They can fold several different times if need be in order to get that port length for the low tuning. Now with this, it obviously becomes much more challenging to bend and fold this port. I do think that you could take a really large miter saw or even make yourself some sort of jig where you could take a big large wood saw and cut through this at an angle. And then if you think about it, if you cut through at an angle, you could spin that piece 180 degrees and you can mate the two together and now you would have a 90 degree turn. But obviously doing all that is quite a bit of work and it could just lead to some weird port issues depending on the size of your port. That's one of the reasons that I think it's more simple to just use a slot port. And unfortunately, I think a lot of times when guys hear more simple, they think that that means it's not as good and that's not the case. Sometimes keeping it simple is best. Now, if we were using a high tuning frequency where the port becomes much more short, keeping that same consistent air volume, then this is obviously more of a viable option. Usually a higher tuning frequency is something that you might be more likely to see on an SPL build. And when it comes to SPL, we know that it's a benefit to be able to quickly change things out to do testing and to maybe get that little bit more extra output. So that is a nice advantage of this is if you think about it, we could build something exactly like this. We could make this basically a flange. So we would have our box face with a much larger hole. We could put this in and attach the flange. And if we think about it, we could pull this out and swap it out for a different length one if need be. That way you could have one that is tuned lower and a box that is tuned higher simply by swapping these out. That's something that people will oftentimes do with a circular port as well. Just another thing to consider. So there we have it, my friends, the Octoport. Now question of the episode for you guys, is the Octoport something that you would incorporate into a future build or do you wanna stick with the tried and true slot port? Let me know what you guys think. For your next car audio project where you need a ton of subwoofer power, definitely check out show sponsor Audio Control and their LC-1.1500. Learn more at the link down in the video description. A special thanks to them along with Bart, Mike, Ali, Jerry, Marcos, William, and the rest of the Patreon membership team. A big thanks to all those guys for making these videos possible. Thank you for watching.